All right, one subject that you always have to cover in polymer science is molecular weight. So you might be thinking, molecular weight, that's just molar mass, that seems really easy. Well, it's a little bit trickier than normal because when you make polymers in this polymerization process, you don't end up with all of them having the same length. For example, consider this scenario. Let's imagine that I've got six really uh, short chains in my batch, right? Six of the, of the strands turned out to be really short. Let's say we ended up with three that are medium sized, and then you end up with one that's just crazy, crazy long, okay? So overall, you could calculate the molecular weight based off of averages, right? And that could be based off of the number average or the weight average. Let's do number average first. You'd say, okay, there was six short chains, there was three medium chains, and there was one long chain. Therefore, there was 10 chains total, and the number average would say that 60% of the chains had some small molecular weight. So when we calculate our number average molecular weight, you'd say, you know, 60% times the molecular weight of our short chain plus 0.3. So 30% times the molecular weight of our medium chain plus 0.1% of the molecular weight times our long chain. That's one way you could do it, right? That would be the number average molecular weight. But there's another way to do it, and that's based off of the weight of each of these chains. So think about how much each of these chains weigh. Even though there's six of these short change chains, right, the weight of the short change might be really, really small, right? Because right? they're each so short. The weight of the three medium chains might be moderate, right? The weight of the medium might be moderate. And then the weight of the long chain, if it's really long, it could be huge. Even though there's only one single chain, it could be contributing a really large fraction of the overall molecular weight. Does this make sense, the difference between these two things? So uh, again, in all of these scenarios, when you calculate the molecular weight, you're going to be taking, right, when you calculate the number average or the, the weight average, you're going to be multiplying it by some average molecular weight of the chains within some group, right? But the value that you multiply that by, the fraction, changes. In this case, it's the number fraction. We literally just said, all right, six out of our 10 chains were short, therefore it's 60%, right, 0 0.6. But here, this one, you're using W sub I, and that's the weight fraction of the chains in that. And again, even though there's lots and lots of these really small ones, if they don't weigh very much, it's going to give you a much smaller number than, say, 60%. It might be only 6%, right? Do you see the difference here? Because of that... Uh, because you're taking into account the weight of a few really heavy chains, the weight average molecular weight will always be shifted to the right of the number average molecular weight, okay? Um, and again, in practice when you do this, we don't know the weight and length of every single chain. Instead, what we have are tools that can tell us buckets, right? We can say like, well, we can scan every maybe every order of magnitude of molecular weight we can take and we can create these buckets, right? And then you could say how much of the polymer corresponds to each one of these buckets, right? You could say that the overall weight fraction coming from this category is 5% or 10%. Therefore, you could plug it in for WI. Or you could say in that, in that molecular weight range, you know, 30% of the overall strands lie there. And so the number average would be 30%. And there's lots of different tools for calculating molecular weight. We won't be covering them in this chapter, but there's lots of tools out there. And there's some great polymer science courses you could take to learn about them. Let's do an example of this, though. Um, molecular weight, what it's really getting at is the degree of polymerization. It's telling, it, we want to know how many of these repeat units there are in the chain. When you go from the beginning right here to the end all the way over there, and you're doing it by looking at all of these repeat units, we want to know how many there are, right? One way to do that would be to take the molecular weight of the overall chain and divide it by the molecular weight of this mer unit right there. So the whole chain would be the big molecular weight, either on a number or a weight average. And then the mer unit would be just the repeat unit. If we divide the overall chain length by the individual repeat unit, well, that will tell us how many of these there are. We call that n. And again, we're going to have two n's because you can do it based off of number average or weight average. That's the degree of polymerization. Let's do an example of this. It says The question says the following. It says, which of the following has the highest average degree of polymerization with 
m sub n equal to 254,000 grams per mole. So the overall chain length in all these scenarios is 254,000 grams per mole, right? So if we divide that by the mer weight in each of these instances, then we will end up with the degree of polymerization number averaged, okay? So let's go ahead and do that. The numerator is going to be the same in each of these. It's just 254,000 grams per mole. All we need to do is figure out which one of these four polymers has the lightest uh, repeat unit, right? Which one weighs the least? Okay, we can calculate that. Okay, let's look at what elements are present, and then we'll calculate the mer weight. For the first one, I find that it has six carbons, one nitrogen, 11 hydrogens, and one oxygen. Therefore, its molecular weight, I find it to be one, about 113 grams per mole. Let's do the next one. The next one has four oxygens, 10 carbons. It has 10 hydrogens as well. When I add that one up, it's got 194 grams per mole. What about this next one? Looks like polyvinyl chloride, except it's got two chlorines instead of just one. All right, let's add it up. It's got two carbons, two hydrogens, two chlorines. Chlorines are heavy. They're 35 grams per mole. So this one adds up to be 96. And then the last one, I find that it has three oxygens. It's got 16 carbons and 18 hydrogens. And if we add those up, its total molecular weight would be 258 grams per mole. So which one of those is the smallest? It is this one. Therefore, you'd be dividing a number, 254,000, by the smallest number that's going to give you the largest degree of polymerization. So it's about 100, right? So if you take 254,000 and divide it by 100, then the degree of polymerization is about 2,500. So that's how you calculate degree of polymerization and molecular weight based off of number or weight average. By the way, we've said that small chains, long chains, medium chains, these can all exist they're going to have different properties. We've already seen an example of that with paraffins. We said as you increase the number of carbons, right, as you make these chains longer, they can line up better, and that meant that their boiling point and melting point increased because they were more bound more tightly. Well, it's going to affect other things like stiffness and strength, right? So you want to be able to change these things. What sort of things can you control when you synthesize your polymer, right? Well, one thing you can change is temperature. You can change the amount of radical catalyst, that's your initiator, right? Those things will change uh, what you end up with. Imagine for a minute that you've got a bucket full of monomers, right? You've got a bunch of these little monomers. Now, if I add my initiators to this, what if I was really, really careful and I only added one initiator, right? Let's say I added like a bromine gas, right? So that goes in and that creates one bromine radical and another bromine radical. Right? So this guy could grab this chain, link it to that, this, that, and this, and that one. Meanwhile, this one could go to that chain, link it to that, this, that, that, and that. And all of a sudden, the only thing left that can happen is these two chains can find one another. And you can imagine a scenario where you just get one chain, right? Now, that doesn't happen. In the real world, you get many chains, right? But that's the idea. The less initiator that you add, right, the fewer free radical catalysts that you add, it's going to tend to have longer chains, right? Because uh, in the end, uh, all of your radical, if all of your radical gets used up, right, if all of your radical gets used up, you will find radical at the ends, right? This is where your bromine was, or whatever your radical was in your scenario. It's going to be at the ends of it. So you could imagine that however much free uh, initiator that you add divided by two should be the number of strands that you end up with, right? So doing it with fewer radical, slowing the process down so they have lots of time to grow and find one another will lead to longer chain length.